everyone welcome to another episode of into the pit i am so excited because i have mr dave schrader who if you're not familiar with and i don't know how he wouldn't be but he's on a show called the holzer files and you know we we may mention the show from here to there but i want to get to know mr schrader himself how are you doing i'm doing well how about you man as good as a guy can get who's stuck in the house all the time <laughs> yeah yeah that's kind of what we're all sitting in in that same little weird vein of just making the best out of what we're into right now yeah and trying to keep things going irregardless right no doubt yeah so where, where did you grow up i grew up about 22 miles west of chicago in a suburb called medina illinois medina mm -hmm. what was that like great it was a nice little uh, suburban neighborhood good people good neighbors you know it's kind of town where you grew up and you got up in the morning and ate your cereal and didn't come back until dinner and you were out playing baseball and tag and flashlight tag at night and oh yeah you know, chasing fireflies just just kind of what i wish the idyllic world would be now yeah as a kid you know up until i hit my high school years if those street lights came on, your butt better be in that house. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a blast and we didn't get into any trouble. You know, occasional baseball through somebody's window, but you know. <laughs> no, no trouble. What kind of fun is that? Being in, uh, being a kid and growing up always should be about trouble. Well, I'm trying to um, dumb it down here. Okay. <laughs> So what were the things you liked to do when you were growing up? You know, it's just the uh, typical kid stuff, getting out swimming, playing at the parks, baseball with my buddies, softball, pick up games of football, uh, girl chasing, hanging at the mall, you know, all the fun stuff. Oh, yeah, the mall. Oh, my the God. lost art of mall walking and uh, cruising with your buddies looking for girls. Now it's all outdoor outlets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you're a child of the 70s? Yeah, 70s and 80s. I grew up right in that heat, heat of that whole area. So I was born in 67, and so my, my youth was really soaked into the awesome atmosphere of the 70s and, and throughout the 80s. So it's uh, it was a good time to be alive, good time to have fun and see the world and be a part of something pretty remarkable. Oh, man, 70s were like the best for me because, like, Saturday mornings, I was up and I was watching – you know the Looney Tunes and the Wacky Racers, and uh, one of my favorite shows was uh, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. Do you remember that? Oh, sure. <laughs> and of course, Shazam had to have Shazam every weekend. If you're Fat Albert and all that other stuff. But so, uh, did was that your Saturday too? Oh yeah, definitely. I'd love getting up early, but mine always started with Land of the Lost. Yes. And then swung into Bugs Bunny and Friends and, uh, you know, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, uh, Scooby-Doo, uh, you know, all that Goober and the Ghost Chasers, the Funky Phantom. I used to like all the ghost, like, cartoons. Um, so that was all that. But here, where I grew up, like, Fat Albert was Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning, I think. Really? Yeah. Did you get H.R. Puff and stuff? Oh, sure. <laughs> Lidstown, H.R. Puff and stuff, uh... Boy, that, you know, I wish I had just a little bit of what they were smoking back then. <laughs> yeah, uh, remember Lidsville, and they everybody in the town was a hat. Yeah, Butch <laughs> Patrick, who played Eddie Munster, was the only human besides right. the genie, I think. Yeah, that's true. Oh, man, I forgot all about that. See, I could sit and talk about cartoons all day long, because that was my youth from... I usually got up around 6, because if you got up at 6, you could catch Alvin and the Chipmunks, and then it went on until about noon, and then sometimes there was the cowboy pictures that would come on at lunchtime, and I, I might have to stick around for that, but then it was play, 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 play. So, did you have a favorite toy back then? Gosh, you know, I just, I love anything... Batman, Spider-Man. Um, I remember really wanting the Lone Ranger, Silver, Tonto, and Scout big action figures. So that was kind of my big deal. And when I got that for Christmas one year from Santa, my year was set. So I just uh, I loved playing with those and, and having them around and 
you know, just wherever my imagination would take me. My big dream was the uh, the Evil Knievel and his stunt cycle. So I had that and the stunt rocket. Yeah. <laughs> and then to go about five feet and stop. My God, I wanted the rocket, but that wasn't going to happen for me. <laughs> and my $6 million man. Right, where he could hold him up and look through his bionic eye. Yeah, about the second or third series, I can't remember, they had the bionic grip so he could pick yeah. up the... He could roll down his arm and see the bionic chip that he had in there and pull his fake skin back up. Yes, thank you. Somebody else remembers that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, so you went through school, you got into high school. Did you play sports? No, you know, I, I tried. I blew my knee out in football, baseball, basketball, tennis. So I just decided sports was not my forte. Yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you know who Quentin Corriott is, but he uh, if you ever look him up on YouTube, he played for Texas A&M back in the uh, early 90s, and um, there's one particular play they call the hit, and when he hit this guy, he like broke his collarbone and everything else, and it, it didn't even look like he took much of a charge at him, but we were teammates, and... and uh, in junior high and we had practice and he came in and he plowed into me and that's when I decided you know I love football but I think I'll stay to watch and get on the couch yeah <laughs> yeah you take a couple of good hits and I remember playing in that one game when I blew out my knee I you know I was playing with the high schoolers uh, mm -hmm. the high school play group and it was after uh, I tried out and we went out and we were just doing a pickup game and nobody ever throws to me and nobody ever covers me so I just said I'll get deep hit me and they kind of gave me this look and I was a real tall wiry skinny kid so I took off like a bat out of hell and again nobody covered me so this big rainbow pass comes flying over I caught it and these guys come zipping at me and they hit me and I'm dragging one and another guy hits me and I'm dragging two and I'm doing okay and I'm not going down and I'm like yeah I'm showing them who's the boss and a third guy hits me and they all kind of move in different directions and my knee my knee just goes shink and oh. I hit the ground like a ton of bricks and uh, didn't know what happened. And I went to stand up and it was like I was stepping in jello and I just hit the ground again and eased myself off the, the property, uh, let them continue on with the game. And I sat there watching the, the, the jeans start to tighten as my knee swelled up to like the size of a cantaloupe. Oh and uh, then I had to drag my sorry ass all the way to the sidelines to get in the car, go to the doctor and have him tap my knee. I think they drained 150 cc's of fluid off of my knee after that. Oh my god, dude. Yeah. It's, so you, you finish out school. Mm -hmm. Did you have aspirations to go on to do something different? You know, like going to college or anything like that? No, I, I hated, absolutely hated school. So after high school ended in 85, I had no aspirations to do anything. So I went into sales and, mm -hmm. uh, I made a lot of money doing sales and had fun with that. And then I found out in uh, the end part of 87 that I was going to be a dad oh. for the first time and uh, decided, well, I better get some vision here. So I uh, I applied for college and got in three years after I'd uh, left high school and I got accepted to Winona State University and I went in and, and uh, was there for almost two years, fell in love with radio and uh, kind of started our my, my career, met my co-host from Darkness Radio, Tim Dennis there, and we became buddies, and lo and behold, that was what, 1988, 89, 90, I was on the radio at Winona State University at KQAL, and then uh, went off into the real world to continue in sales. Tim stayed in radio, and then in 2005, Tim contacted me and said, we want to do a radio show together, and January 1st, 2006, we launched Darkness Radio. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know... I, I love this platform because I really wanted to be a DJ when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And because I love, love, love music. But I, I took a class and it seemed a little intimidating to me trying to learn all the gadgets and everything. And instead of sticking it out, I let it scare me and it, it chased me away. My dad told me if you don't finish college, you're going to be a ditch digger. Well, you know, really, Dad? Well, I went to work for uh, the city that we lived in, and lo and behold, 
I became a ditch digger. <laughs> so your dad had uh, psychic premonitions as well, huh? <laughs> right. So, you know, I go on from there. Um, I've stayed in the business for 20 some odd years and became a supervisor, but it just was not what I was looking for. Uh, I got into the paranormal and I said, you know what? I'd like to try my hand at podcasting. So I've been doing it for a few years now and now I have a new love and I feel like this is what I'm meant to do. Did you get, did you get that kind of sense when you got into it? Uh, well, I, I'd always wanted to do radio since I was a little kid. So, you know, when, when I had the opportunity in college to do it and then for my friend to bring me back into the fold, and let me do radio again, I just took to it like a duck to water. Okay, so, and there's like nothing else that you could see yourself doing? Well, obviously I, I'm on TV with the Holzer Files. I, I worked behind the scenes on Ghost Adventures for three years. I was on seven or eight episodes of Ghost Adventures on, on camera. I was on Paranormal State. I did a, a 12 episode miniseries called Paranormal Challenge on Travel Channel back in 2011 and 12. So I've been out there doing all types of things. I, you know, I authored, co authored a book called The Other Side, uh, which was a guide for ghost hunting in the paranormal. So I've, you know, I've had my hands in quite a few different, uh, you know, different things, just keeping myself afloat and, and interested in, in examining more and more. Plus, I get to travel the world and see cool places, meet great people, and just have a good time. Now, working behind the scenes, is that how you actually got into doing the paranormal, or did something happen to no, get you interested? I, I'd had the paranormal around me my whole life, so I, I've always had strange experiences with ghosts and and interests in cryptids and UFOs, so it just made sense to uh, follow that passion with my radio and love of paranormal and marry them together and create Darkness Radio. Okay, now I heard a rumor about you. Mm -hmm. And I want, want to see if you're going to confirm this or not. Um, we have a mutual friend, and I'm not going to tell you who she is. But she said when you're, like, off camera, you are a cut-up. But then as soon as the cameras come on, you are just as straight-laced and as serious as can be. Is this true? For the TV show, yeah. Because with the Holzer Files, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm following in the footsteps of, of – very serious investigator and I don't want to do him any misjustice by uh, uh, you know, acting like a goof right. so you know on my radio show I can be Dave and be goofy and funny and have fun with it and when I'm on TV I, I you know I'm trying to follow in this vein plus people are you know asking us for help nobody wants a goofball coming in and cutting up all the time and not taking it seriously or appearing to not take it seriously so I do what I can to lend some credibility and credence to what we do. And so what got you into doing the, the Holzer files? Uh, I got a phone call from the production company. They had done their research on me. They liked what I brought to Darkness Radio, and I was also a fill-in host on Coast to Coast AM, and they just asked if I would be interested in in uh, becoming a lead investigator on, um, on the Holzer files and uh, kind of well, there we go. There's some light. Um, kind of uh, take take what I do on the radio and you know position it to where I can I can do it on TV and ask the questions and probe and try to get to the uh, understanding of what it is we're really examining. Yeah, I mean you're a pretty straight laced guy, and um, I'm be honest with you, I was a little intimidated whenever I, I asked if you'd be on the show, but. Um, you know, somebody like Hans Holzer, mm -hmm. who is an extremely, not only intelligent man, but very thorough and very serious. Right. Do you find it difficult to kind of follow in those footsteps, or do you feel like you're able to, to step in and just kind of take off where he left? As off? much as I can while still being me. Um, you know, I try to bring... I try to bring the, the seriousness and intensity that Hans Holzer brought, but still be Dave and, yeah. and kind of look at things through a different lens. And that's, you know, I, I think what they wanted for me to begin with. So I'm not supposed to be Hans Holzer Jr. I'm supposed to just be Dave Schrader, who's now reinvestigating with our team, you know, uh, Shane Pittman, who you've had on the show, and Cindy Keza, our medium, who's extremely talented. And we were just kind of 
re-examining. Uh, Hans Holzer knew that cases were never completely filled, no matter what he did and how many spirits he might help cross over. There sometimes would be new things that would unfold. So a story was never truly closed. And we're going back in with new ideas, new concepts, and the ability to dig deeper into history than even Hans Holzer was able to do back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Mm -hmm. Well, you figure now you have computers that you can do a lot more research, get into right. these backgrounds. Uh, of course, you've got the old-fashioned go to the library and go into City Hall and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what about the equipment that y'all use? Is, do you find that to be a hindrance, or is it actually a tool that's, that's able to... Uh, expand on what he did oh you know hans holzer was never a big fan of technology mm -hmm. he believed in being there and being a part of the moment and you know he would use cameras and audio recorders of course and his medium so i tr i do try to keep it scaled down as much as i can shane is kind of our tech guy so he's he's got a lot more of the tech that he uses and and i'll use the sls camera my audio recorder maybe a spirit box, but I, I like to just kind of absorb into the environment. And, you know, I, I just find that to be more rewarding for me when I'm able to kind of connect with the energy and I'm not just focused on a little square monitor in front of me that I'm trying to look at while, you know, in these beautiful historic places. I want to, I want to be there. I want to watch it. I want to see it. I want to, and I want to see if there's anything. You keep looking at the little mini screen and then looking up, your eyes are constantly trying to make variances in the dark and you can get all kinds of false positives. So I'm very cautious with the equipment that I use and how I use it so that uh, if I have an experience, I, I have a good idea that it was a legitimate experience and not just a trick of the eyes because of the equipment I'm using. Yeah, I find that a lot of people that have been in it for a while, I mean, they are discovering new tools and things, but they all seem to go back to the old fashioned ways. As much as you can, but it's more exciting. A lot of the equipment now gives you that immediate response that we're all so trained to want. We're the MTV generation, and we want it now, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, I want my EVP, right? We want it now. <laughs> we don't want to take it back, listen to all the recordings, wait for it. You want it. You want it now. You want the video. You want the audio. You want the photograph. And so I understand that to a degree, but I also understand that sometimes that can, uh, you can miss out on being in the moment. And what about the scientific aspects of these things? Do you do you have people that you can send these um, different pieces of evidence to that can scrutinize it for you, or are, or do sure. you all do you do you do have that? Huh? I well, yeah, we lean on people in the field that I trust, uh, photographers, to take a look at a picture or video to tell me, hey, you know, does this look natural? Plus, we've got you got to remember when we're shooting, we're working with guys that have been working behind the cameras for, you know. 10, 20, 30 years. So if they know what a lens flare looks like, they know what a uh, dust orb is going to look like. So they, they're familiar with those images and they help us dismiss a lot of garbage evidence. Mm -hmm. And you'll see us, and I mean, I, I've been doing this for 14 years. Shane's been doing it, I think, for 10 years. So we know what we're looking for when we're reviewing evidence. And if something kind of baffles us, we'll take it to each other or sometimes an outside source to get a fresh pair of eyes and perspective on, on what it is and do they have any idea what we might be looking at. Do y'all feel like that you lean a lot on Cindy? We try not to. I mean, we lean on her to kind of crack aspects of the case. Um, there are times when I'll go in knowing, knowing the case from the history logs, what uh, historians have told us about the locations and what Hans found out when he visited sometimes she'll come up with aspects that were like that that doesn't register and then i pushes me to dig a little deeper ask a few more questions pointed questions and all of a sudden things start to unfold from the experiencers and historians and then we can start to tie some of these stories up and understand the narrative that's going behind the scenes with these characters and you know who these spirits might be why they're there and it's eerie how good she is at what she does but you know, Hans Holzer realized a medium is a really good tool to use, but it should not also be the only aspect. There has to be some research. 
the, the evidence that she's able to supply and then what we were able to capture to help corroborate it, kind of creating the holy trinity of, you know, of information. We've got the technology, we've got the inquisitive uh, history that I'm able to get, and we've got the medium. And I think that's what makes the show come together really well is there's this beautiful um, uh, pairing that happens between the three of us that opens these stories up and allows us to go deeper into the mysteries and histories that are there. Yeah, I hear a lot of people talk about they get into these groups and and some of them are friends, but some of them seem more like family. Y'all seem pretty close knit on the show. Yeah, it's like a brand new brother and sister in my life. I love both of them very much, and you know we keep in touch and try to keep each other's spirits up during this crisis we're in right now. And um, you know we're we're just there for each other on set and off set. Yeah, Shane is a character. <laughs> yeah, that he is. That he is. All right, a little bit more personal here. Okay. When it comes to mediums, and and mm -hmm. I've told people this time and time again, I used to think that all they were were like a circus side show. They're just they know how to read you and they know what kind of information to pull out of you. Um, have you always believed in mediums and psychics, or did you have to go through that process of prove it to me? Yes, yes, and yes. I, I've always been open to the concept because I've had, I've seen ghosts. I've heard things. So obviously there is something to being sensitive to the situation and somebody that's attuned that from a very early age on or works at it and hones it, why wouldn't they be able to continue to tap into it? Do I believe everybody? No, right? Just like there are singers out there that, you know, there are singers. There are the Frank Sinatras, the... Uh, you know, the Elvis Presleys, and then you've got the Kanye Wests who aren't singers, but they're performers. Mm. You know, there, there's a difference in the element that they bring to what they do. I've seen a lot of performers, um, but there's an elegance sometimes to what they do as well. I, I'll tell you, fake or not, I've seen mediums help somebody heal quicker from the trauma of losing a loved one than I do seeing them lay on a couch and talk about it with a hundred and fifty dollar an hour uh, therapist for ten years of their lives. So it, it just goes about you know what exactly are you looking for? Now the true connections, like Cindy will bring to us, or Michael and Marty Perry uh, from SpiritArt.com are two of the most talented. Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer, uh, amazing guy. Um, Chip Coffee. These are some of the mediums I've worked with. I've seen them do things that I goes above and beyond the generic glossing. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes they aren't hitting the surface as well, but I believe that's, they're, they're covering the surface to get deeper. Some people are just happy with, you know, um, Kyle, I, I'm sensing there's an older man near you. Does this make sense? Like a, a dad or a grandfather? Do you, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Th this, he feels very paternal, like a father. Is, is your father crossed over? Yes, as a matter of fact. And he's here letting me know how much he is proud of what you're doing and that you're living your dream. Now, see, that was, I have no mediumistic ability, but I was fishing, right? Now, as you said, no, my dad's still alive, but my grandfather, I could have easily gone, but you were very close with your grandfather, right? I mean, he was almost like another father figure to you. That's what I'm picking up on. So I've seen that kind of aspect. And it, it's crazy. But then I'll watch, uh, you know, Michael and, and Marty Perry do their, their gallery session. And Michael is connecting with somebody over here. And all of a sudden he stops and he's like, I'll be right with you. Just hold on. And he's talking to another spirit and he comes back. And he's like, I'm sorry. I'm, this is so rude. I'm, please, I'm, I'm talking to somebody else. I'll get to you. And he goes back to the, and all of a sudden he goes, I'm really sorry. Can, would you stay here so I can continue this? All right, the spirit says they're going to stay here, Kyle. I've got to go over here. This is very distracting. All right, what do you need to say? Okay, okay. And then he turns to the audience. He goes, who used to have a horse with uh, a brown face on one side, white on the other, and a big blue eye? And this woman, right where he's looking, bursts into tears. And he goes, your horse is here. He wants you to know how much he loves you and that he's always with you. Now can I go on with their... Okay, thank you, thank you, yes. She's got your message, thank you. And then he turns, how the f do you pull that out of the air? True. The specifics of, the, it wasn't a, 
oh, do you have a, a parent or loved one that died with an R-J-O-P-T-L-M-N name, something like that. That's so generic and basic. Michael and Marty Perry, they just hit things like that. Cindy Kazel will go into these locations without any prior knowledge of where we're going to go or what it is that we're examining at these locations, and she connects to something, something absurd, but something highly detailed. And then I dig, and, you know, when we did uh, an episode with um, the Ocean Born Mary case, mm -hmm. she kept saying, I'm seeing a flag, like a, like a pirate flag. It's red and yellow and black. And Shane and I had the pirate flags that, that this pirate used. They were black and white, every one of them. And it was a simple, she's like, there's a, a hand with a sword. And we're like, nope, nope. And it's kind of like, oh, look, we, you know, she screwed up. And then as I start digging, I find that that was their regular flag. And when they were ready to board, they had a second flag. And lo and behold, the second flag was red with an hourglass and yellow on it and an arm carrying a big sword. Oh, That's wow. what they would run up the old flagpole when they were ready to board and take over your ship. That was their Jolly Roger. So she's spot on. How how could she know that? Because had she not brought that up to me, I wouldn't have thought to ask the historian this question. And the historian's like, oh, actually, you wouldn't know this because this uh, pirate, uh, one of the people that served under this pirate, also created a secondary flag, and she flips open and shows us his image. How, you know, that, to me, is so mind-blowing that you just can't dismiss what it is that, that just occurred. That's not a generic base deal. It's something real. It's connected, you know. Um, and then my own experience in, in uh, 1988, um, 1987, uh, you know, it was New Year's Eve, 1988. I'd been out at parties, and I'd stayed the designated driver. And every time I passed my mom's street dropping people off, I'd have these horrible, cringy visions of her being wheeled out to an ambulance dead. And I'm like, what is wrong? God, Dave, get out of your own head. And it happened all night long as I passed. And then I went and dropped my final friend off. He's like, dude, come on in and just spend the night. You're tired. I'm like, all right. So we went in and we started. And I'm like 20 minutes in. I'm like, dude, I got to go home. Something's wrong. It's got to get something's wrong. And I left, went home. My mom comes shuffling out in the living or in the kitchen. With one eye closed, one eye open, her hair all crazy. And she's like, what's going on? I said, oh, mom, I'm, I just got home. I'm safe. I stayed sober. I drove everybody home. She goes, good boy, let me let me go to the bathroom. I'll come out and talk to you. And I said, okay. She turned around, boom, and collapsed. She had a massive seizure. Mm -hmm. Now, she didn't die, thankfully, at that point. And uh, we were able to revive her, get her to the hospital, and get her checked out. But I felt drawn to her all night long. And I get there. The minute I get there, she, she suffers a grand mal seizure. Mm -hmm. So she had never done that in her life and never did it again. So I can't, I can't make hide you know, sense of it. But to, I can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater that all mediums and psychics are wrong when I've had the experiences myself. Now, I don't, I don't want to take away from your time, but I have a little sure. story similar to that where okay. I, I met my first psychic medium and I went in for a reading. Never met this lady in my life. She didn't know me from Adam. You've probably heard that said a hundred times, but this is exactly true. I wasn't even there for the reading. My wife was. And she looked at me and she said, you just lost somebody today. His name starts with a B. Okay. And it blew my mind because that morning my grandfather passed away. His name was Byron. Wow. Okay. Coincidence? I don't know. She wasn't fishing. She just came right out and told me the facts and then she started laughing and I'm like what in the world are you laughing about she goes I keep seeing the water boy why do I keep seeing the water boy and my wife and I turned each other and started busting out laughing because the running joke between me her and her daughter is that uh, when like especially driving around or we're just hanging out we start doing stupid quotes from the water boy love that stupid movie and no but nobody else knows that well, of course now you do and whoever's watching this but 
How do you pick up on something like that? How do, how do you have a clue as to what what that is? Which means there's there is some kind of interconnectedness, and we're you're either speaking to the spirits that are there or I'm connecting to this kind of psychic Rolodex that stays around Kyle. And when I'm connecting with you, I'm not really seeing the dead. I'm seeing a projection of your memories, your thoughts, everything that's kept in your file effects in your body and soul. Either way, it's pretty freaking remarkable and, and shouldn't just be dismissed. I mean, that's a, that's a really incredible gift. I saw an experiment and I'm not going to mention the show, but um, two gentlemen were sitting in a, one was in a couch, one was in a chair, and they were next to each other, and they had a thermal imaging camera going on, and each of them had a certain colored looking aura about them, and as they're asking questions, and of course the one gentleman that's getting asked the question is making it as general as possible, no kind of details, but you could actually see the aura blending in with his now is that real have you ever seen that before yeah that was on a ghost hunters episode with jay and grant <clears throat> and uh you know it, it was almost like while while grant was looking at jay thinking you you saw kind of this energy just stream towards jay i don't know was that what it was capturing or did the light parameters change when he turned the side of his face and and the camera was trying to pull it I don't know. It, it's it, unfortunately we don't know. We can't measure what happened between them. But it was it was a great capture. Very cool. Yeah, awesome. You know, I'm I'm loving talking about the paranormal, but I still want to know more about Mr. Schrader. What is is there anything that you've ever wanted to talk about when you were on a show? It just it doesn't even have to be paranormal. Anything you wanted to be asked, or you just wanted to talk about? You know, I guess I never really bother thinking things through like that because if I start putting it out that, boy, I hope they ask me this and they don't, it just leaves you in a sense of, ah, oh, damn it, they never got around anything good. So I just, I have no expectations. I just enjoy a free flowing conversation and what comes up comes up. You know, I mean, I, I want people to know I don't, I don't chase the paranormal for a thrill. I, I, I'm fascinated and have had a long standing fear of death, which I've talked about openly for years that only recently subsided. Um, it's always been in the concept of if spirits are there and they need help, is there something we can do? How do we go about doing it? And what does this tell us about who we are and what it's like to survive the death of our physical form? So that, that's really where I, I come in from. But I, you know, I have a very tender heart when it comes to lost souls and spirits and I just, you know, I wish I could make their lives better, their afterlives better, whatever it is. So, you know, I mean, that's kind of my drive and determination in doing what we do, which I think works well with Hans Holzer's method as well. He just wants to help the spirits move on. And if there's something I can do in my world, I'm, I, you know, I, I think as Hans would say, there is no um, coincidence. Synchronicity is a better match. And, and, you know, the synchronicity of Hans Holzer and his desires and mine mesh really well. Um, we're indebted to his family for opening these files to us and allowing us in to investigate again and uh, and tell these stories. Um, and I'm, you know, certainly not putting myself up on the same level as Hans Holzer, uh, not by any means, but, you know, I think we both have that same passion for helping. Well, you know, I, I, I don't see it the people that I, I, I watch on television, I don't see them trying to step into somebody else's shoes. I see them taking on their own personality and beliefs and trying something different. And that's all, you know, that's all anybody can do is try to bring a new light to a shady circumstance, right? A dark, dark realm that there are too many, there are more questions than there are answers. Because yeah, Dave Schrader is Dave Schrader. No, you're not Hans Holzer, but I could see Hans sh looking at you and saying, hey, way to look at it, you know? Um, personally, whenever I do put out evidence, and it's not very often, I enjoy people coming in and scrutinizing it. Yeah. And the reason behind that is is because I feel that it's making me a 
not only more aware person, but somebody that's going to strive a little bit harder to be a, a little bit harder on my evidence. Um, you know, how much of that do you deal with on the show yourself? I mean, as far as like going through the evidence and things like that. Well, we're very, you know, we scrutinize the evidence. There's some evidence that doesn't get used on the show that we wish would have. There is uh, some evidence that, you know, we, we just turn away flatly because we just, yeah, it's interesting, but if we can't really discern what what it is or what it might mean, we just kind of discard it for now. doesn't mean we won't revisit it in the future. Okay. Now, another But I like, bit. like you, I, I like to have people examine the evidence with me. And, you know, sometimes something that will blow me away and I'll be like, good God, what is that? Oh, Dave, remember that's when the door opened up outside and it threw us for a loop and blah, blah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It created that sound because of the door. And, you know, you, you, keep, you keep in check when you have people working and it makes you want to be a better investigator because you don't want to get caught with your pants down doing those, oh, my God, it's a ghost. No, Dave, it was a screen door. Right, so you've got to you've got to keep your your game elevated. It's just going to be a strange analogy, but this is the way I look at it. You know, have you ever done an experiment where you put your hand up in front of your face, and then you get like a, a round tube or you roll up some paper and you put it right next to your hand and you stare at it long enough, it looks almost like it's making a hole in your hand. No, I, I had actual toys to play with, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> I had paper toilet or paper uh, rolls to play with. So hey, thanks for hurting my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> no, if, if you ever look at it, it is an optical illusion. It actually looks like the circle is cutting into your hand. That's You look at that and you go, oh, my God, that's paranormal. But if you look at it in a different way, you notice there's two separate things there. Right now, my my point being is is I feel like people are not taking enough time to look at it at every angle. They're too quick to say Agreed. this is paranormal. Agreed, and that's why we're we're cautious. Not only are we cautious with is this paranormal, but is it demonic? Is it dark? Is it malevolent? Sometimes I think it's just the way the spirit's trying to get your attention. Doesn't mean it's uh, some dark force from hell. It may just mean that. The tug of the hair was all it was able to do to get your attention. Do you honestly think there's that much demonic activity going on out there? I think there's demonic activity. I, I can't say I think it's nearly as rampant, but, you know, to the uh, people I associate with that, that make a living off of going into those places, they're getting called in because something is dark and malevolent there. So, yeah, it's not like they just walked into a Waffle House and they're like, there's a demon here. They went there because somebody believed there was something dark and malevolent. When we get called into a lot of these locations, they'll believe something is dark and malevolent. Sometimes we're able to uncover. I think it's not dark and malevolent. I think it's confused. I think it's just trying to get your attention. So I don't think we've run into anything we would consider a demon in the season and a half we filmed. Okay. And have you had anybody that you've contacted and say, hey, we want to follow up on this, and they get all excited, and they're like, ooh, let's set something up to make it look like something's happening to see if we can fool them. Have you ever run Not so that? far, knock on wood, no. I mean, everybody's been pretty, you know, because they don't want to look like idiots either. They don't want to have us in making these grand claims and then find out nothing's there. Plus, we're able to capture evidence, you know, we're getting something. So most of the people that have us in, Oh, all of the people want us there. Um, secondly, they they want us to give real answers because it might be an ongoing business, a museum, a house, uh, you know, a historical center, um, and they they just want answers. And our job is not to go in and scare the crap out of them. Our job is to go in and give them answers. Do you do a lot more debunking than you actually find evidence? Yeah, there's a lot we debunk that you don't get to see on the show because it's boring, right? We don't want to hear. <laughs> You don't want to hear boom, boom, oh my, what was that? Oh, it's just the, you know, camera guy tripped outside. It's boring. So we don't, but we do a lockdown. All of our people have to be away from the location. Uh, it's just us and our sound guy and, and uh, camera guy that are with us. And that's it. And uh, that way, if something does happen, everybody is right in each other's vision and accountable. 
Now, I know shows like Ghost Hunters, they'll be in a location for a week, two weeks, sometimes a little bit more. Do, do y'all do the same thing? We are usually, we, we get to the location and we spend about five days there. We do, uh, first night, we'll usually do a baseline investigation just to get readings, to get the, the general vibe of the place for Cindy, to get some clues from her on things I might want to look into. Then, um, really, we, we spend one full day and evening in there investigating. The rest is into the historical societies, talking to experiencers, talking to historians, talking to um city planners talking to whoever we can get our hands on that might have some insights that they could share with us because we, we try to treat this more like a crime procedural where we're picking the case apart and trying to make sense of it as opposed to accepting everything on the face value that it is what it is well i know watching you i would have sworn you were some kind of police detective or something well it's in my blood my biological father was a, a police uh, officer and, and undercover agent and um my great grandfather was a police officer and you know we've got a lot of that in our blood and dangerous situations have you really walked into something extremely dangerous that you just like okay we need to get the hell out of here yeah marriage <laughs> i was that way with my first marriage actually <laughs> i was that way with my first two marriages now i'm in a good place but uh I, you know I try to go in open because, again, I don't want to jump to the conclusion of demonic. You know, I got knocked on my butt at the Whaley House in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And it'd be real easy to jump to a demonic. That's not what happened. I think we just uncovered a ghost that had been long dormant and didn't like being called out and didn't like having his name, didn't like having the light shown on his name. And I think that he, he was more doing it to get my attention and show me who's the Lord and master of that house. It's not this flesh bag. It's, it's that person, uh, Juan Verdugo. That's who I think is haunting that house. And, um, you know, I'm not saying there aren't other layers of hauntings taking place, but this, this one central figure that I believe was what they were sensing when the Whaley's lived there because they too had experiences that were very, um, alarming and dark. Uh, we believe that's who that they, that's in fact who they were dealing with. All right. The show comes in and they tell you, all right, Dave, this place has been boring. We're going to do a little bit of uh, knocking in the background, or we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Are you walking straight out that door? Yeah. Yeah, I have no interest in, in I have no interest in perpetuating a false narrative or a fake story. Um, I just don't see it, it benefiting anybody. Um, and I think it, it becomes transparent on TV when you're watching it to see people reacting poorly to fake situations. Um, but again, you react differently, you know, uh, to, to certain situations, something that you might normally be like, what the fuck, right? <laughs> Sometimes you're just like, you hear it and you're like, what was that, right? And that's not real dynamic for TV, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I do try to be aware, as I know my co, uh, co-stars do, of being in the moment, and that's why I'm not trying to think about, oh boy, when I get, get home, I got to do my laundry. And that I remember to turn off the TV. I, I'm focused on the moment so that my reactions are pure and in the moment, as opposed to something whizzes by me and I'm still tracking. What was, what was I supposed to do to, ooh, what the hell was that? Right. You kind of, you're dulled your senses. I go in hyper-focused, ready and, and wanting to see if we can experience something. So I'm alert and that's what I think is important. But yeah, if they ask any one of the three of us, um, to fake things, I, I quit in a heartbeat. See, that's what I like to hear because I feel like there are some shows on there that are just doing things just to get the ratings. Yes, it's entertaining, but it makes everybody that's trying to do the right thing look bad. So, well, and this this is what I will say. You know, a lot of people, a lot of the stars of these shows take heat because they're like, "Oh, that that's so scripted and acted." Yeah, sometimes it is. It is acted. And here's what I mean. Because I'm in the middle of having an experience and uh, a lighting system falls down. So you are getting my real excitement of what happened. And boom, 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 boom. Well, that just ruined the, the scene. So, Dave, we got to reset. Can you say what you just said? 
And then you can, you know, it's not us acting. It's us recapturing the moment that actually happened, but got screwed up because the lighting system failed, the camera shut off in the middle of us talking, um, our, our microphone battery went out, something stupid, uh, but not with evidence. You know, there's a difference between uh, me talking to Kyle, who had an experience. So Kyle, talk me through this. Uh, sorry, I stumbled. So Kyle, talk me through what happened to you. See, there's a difference here. That's not me acting. It's me trying to be clean and concise so that you and I can have a good conversation. And, and that's it. Sometimes it'll take you off your game and it does seem active because you're trying to recapture the moment you just lost because of bad timing, a dog barking, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, lighting falling down, your camera quitting, your microphone going out, whatever those instances may be. So that's the worst of the acting that goes on and every one of us has to do it. Just in, I mean, people are not stupid. When I go knock on the door and the door opens and the camera's in there following me in, it's not like the person at the door, this is the first time they've seen me, right? Um, it, it is, but they've already got a camera in there to get this shot. That may be the first time they see me, but there are certain parameters that just have to be done for TV that you just have to forgive. Faking evidence is not one of them, and we wouldn't be a part of that. Now, if I found out afterwards that something happened that wasn't what we put it on TV, I would have no problem addressing it saying, oh, by the way, that's a good point, Kyle. You know, in episode three, when we heard on the wall, we found out a week later that it was actually the neighbors knocking on their garage door trying to get their wife's attention. I would, I'd own up to that if we found out at another point what happened. And and our, our production team is very tight about that. That's what they want as well. They want legitimacy, honesty. They don't want to catch us doing something stupid either because then that makes us all look like idiots. And, yeah. and that's where it goes. But there is no acting, there is no faking, there is only what we show you um, because that's all there is. There's no other little aspects. Like I said, I think it can be forgiven for the fact that I started to talk and I go, so Kyle, when you, <coughs> when you had that experience, nobody wants to see that on TV. What they want is, so Kyle, when you had that experience, walk me through what that felt like. They want to clean, they don't want, Wait, do I have something in my nose? Did it? Okay, we, okay, no, all right, good. So Kyle, tell, they don't want all that nonsense, right? right. It's, 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 it lends nothing to the story. So you want to you know, keep things concise, and when we have to redo things, it's only in addressing what, what just happened to us, addressing the question at hand, readdressing the guest I'm talking to, or vice versa. Um, because, you know, especially when you're interviewing people and they're not used to it, and they've got their microphone underneath here. Some of the women will, oh, my, and I was, oh, I was so terrified, and I saw this thing, and it was uh, it was just so alarming. And the whole time, what the microphone is hearing. So I was, and then I saw the, mm -hmm. so they have to recut those moments and, and get the audio again so that we can hear a clean version of what this person is saying. Yeah, I uh, I've talked to this, about this on some of my other shows, but uh, I had the privilege of doing a pilot for A and E some years ago. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't make it on television, but the experience was was really fun. Um, you know, you've got the microphone hooked up to you all day. Somebody's following you around with a camera all day, and then they uh, and this wasn't paranormal, by the way. We were we were building a bar. And it was a Houston Texans themed bar. And uh, yeah, it was like giving Kryptonite Superman to me. I oh, hated it. But anyway, we made this football helmet that was like six foot tall. And we had to find a sticker with the logo to put on the side of it. So they ordered it. We found a place down the road that could print them up for us. We get there. We're pulling in the driveway. The director comes out and says, Hey, hey, hold on. Can y'all go back around and come back in the driveway again? I'm like, Okay. We drive around, come back in there. Hey, um, try coming in like this. I'm like, what the freaking difference does it make how you drive into a driveway? I bet you I walked into that store a dozen times. 
And then you go up to the counter and they right. they made the stickers wrong. They had them both facing the same direction. Well, you know, on a football helmet, they're they're mirrored on the, you know. And so I I'm like, uh, dude, these are wrong. And they're like, ooh, that's great. Let's do that again. You know, I, I, it, it gets annoying after a while. So I know what he went through. Right, but the, the, it's not like they made the print wrong so that you'd have something to react to. They just want to capture your actual reaction. And then when something happens, they're like, ooh, that's interesting. Let's let's examine that. Dave, go back into that and ask that question again. You know, and, and that might be the direction I get. Can you take that a little further? What did he mean by that? And so, Because sometimes you are questioning and sometimes sometimes as you're going through it I may have just heard a 10 minute story from you and I focused on what you said at this point and I totally missed the segment where you said and then my mom came to me twice as a ghost because I was so focused on the ghost story I was asking about right and then I'll be reminded Dave did he just say he saw a ghost his mom's ghost so Kyle wait uh, I don't mean to go back now, but you said you also saw your mom's ghost, and that's because it could be an important part of the story. Maybe it doesn't turn out to be an important part of the story, but they'll they'll help point out too if I missed a point or a question. But it's all in the integrity of keeping the the product pure and getting, um, which is what my co-host on my radio show does. If I miss a question, sometimes he injects and jumps into, "Hey, Dave, wait before we go any further. Kyle just mentioned ABC, and before we go on to XYZ." What, what what was DEF like? And it's a good point, and you have to you have to flesh that out because that may be the missing piece of the puzzle. True. Well, I mean that part of it I understand being it's not scripted, but having to do it over again, getting a different reaction, right? Or you know even a different angle, different take on what you just said. My my concern is is it's it's gone around in especially in the podcasting community that you have shows out there that are just there for the ratings and um you know i would much rather watch an episode uh, of uh holzer files or the ghost hunters and they go the whole evening and they don't capture anything but they're able to debunk things that that's going on because it's real but with that said, I was a part of an episode on Ghost Adventures mm -hmm. where we didn't capture anything, the entire mm -hmm. episode. And we were in this house that was supposedly demonically haunted in, in uh, Washington. And to their credit, they ran the episode without catching any evidence. And I was so proud of them for running that episode because I would, you know, you'd have thought they would have just scrapped it. And Zach's like, no, dude, we got nothing. We need to show, you know, that it's not always a home run. And we showed it. And fans berated and bitched oh boy you tease us through the whole thing and there's nothing you guys get nothing and I'm like well, what do you want you complain because oh this is all fake and a setup then when we deliver you an episode where really nothing does happen oh this is a boring waste of time see there's no satisfying everybody this now is true. This is true. There, were, there was a big contingent that really stood up and cheered and waved their flags and they're like yes that was awesome you guys showed it exactly as it needed to be it was nothing nothing happened we never said that there wasn't anything paranormal there. We just don't believe there was anything paranormal. We believe it was more around the guy and his woman, uh, not necessarily paranormal. Right. Um, and, you know, that's the way we left it. Uh, you know, people just, they think they know what they want until it's out there. And, and proof is, I'll go watch uh, a ghost hunter show, ghost hunters, not the TV series, but a ghost hunting show on YouTube. That's all jump scares and overreactions, and it's got 6.7 million viewers. I watch one that's meticulous in showing how they unroll the cables, set up their equipment, and do this, do that, and then still capture good evidence. They've got 185 views. Why? This is what everybody wants. They want to see the scientific approach. No, they don't. It's boring as hell. Nobody wants to watch you unspooling cable. Nobody wants to watch you focusing your cameras or recalibrating your EMF detector. It's all boring. Boring, boring, boring. Anybody that tells you it's not is a liar. So it, it's, you know, again, well, what you think you want to see and what you see are two different things. And unfortunately, a show like that would be awesome for the first 15 minutes. And then you're like, God, 
why don't they go out and play catch in the yard until it gets dark? You know, let's ghost yeah. adventures this up. Let's ghost hunters or ghost nation or Holzer files this up and give us something in between. You know, reality is slow, tedious, and boring. Reality TV is taking all the slow, tedious, and boring parts and compressing them into a 42 minute program and giving you the best elements that we can supply to you. So a lot of people would say, oh, those shows are fake and they're out for ratings. What makes them fake? And every show, every show is out for ratings. Every show, we all want ratings because that's how you get advertisers. That's how you stay on the air. It's what you're willing to do to get those ratings. Now everybody wants to jump on and well, ghost, ghost hunters took a lot of flack for a while and oh, they're faking this, they're faking that. Where's the definitive proof of that? Because you don't believe it or you think you're a stay-at-home couch detective and you watch something on TV and you know how to debunk it or you can you can redo that. Now, just because I can redo something, does that mean that the first time it happened, it wasn't real, right? So I, I, I just tell people to be cautious with their ability to broad stroke and say, oh, this is all fake. Because I've worked on Paranormal State in the episodes I worked on, I, I was on screen once and there for filming for two others. What you saw in the final product is exactly what happened. There was no embellishment. There was no weirdness. Ghost Adventures, I did seven or eight episodes with them, plus their two live events. Um, everything that appears in the episode is exactly how it played out in the episode. There was no embellishment. There was no fakery. There was no junk evidence. It was what they show. So I can only attest to the things I've seen. And what I've seen in these programs is that they're giving you the best of what they've got. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to tell us all this. Well, listen, it, we just pared down an eight hour investigation to a five minute window on an episode. So yeah, you're going to get the best parts because nobody wants to watch eight hours of Dave sitting in the corner going. <laughs> That's true. Hello? So, you know, you, you got to cut short, tighten it up. And that's what you deliver. And that's why Ghost Adventures is going on like year 92 and Ghost Hunters is back and Ghost Nation is back and Kindred Spirits and, and uh, uh, Holzer Files and the Ghost Brothers and, and Destination Beer. And, you know, all of these shows are popular because of that aspect, because it's good storytelling, good personalities. And to, you got to give it to the credit of these shows. When Ghost Adventures goes out and they don't get a lot of activity, they spice it up with other adventures that they did that day. You see Zach running out and grabbing a rattlesnake by the tail, right? You see other funny, goofy, silly things that give you a look into the lives of those people that you're watching every day so that you know they're more than just Dave Schrader going, really, can you tell me more, Kyle? Yeah. Right? Because that gets boring after a while too. People want to know that we're humans. So I appreciate when he shows will take you the next step and, and give you a little bit of who they really are and giving us a chance to see the group dynamic work together and and the personalities as opposed to just ghost hunting. So that has to be taken into account. You know, oh, Zach and they're, they're making a goof of themselves for doing this. No, they're being them. They're being fun and dynamic and exciting to watch. How do I know? Because they get a million plus viewers every week tuning in to watch it. So you know, they're not wrong. Uh, that's what, what our goal is. We want to provide a good piece and good content, but tell the story in a different way with a different crew. And hopefully we'll be on the air for 15 seasons, just like every other show wants to be on the air for 15 seasons. So what you do is you, you create the best product you possibly can. I can't attest to if shows are faking or not. I know these people. They're like brothers and sisters to me. Of course, there's always rumblings. You always hear people. But you know what? It's always sour grapes people. It's somebody that got removed from the show because they were doing drugs or racist or sexual harassment of cast members or, you know, um, other issues that might be behind the scenes. They're the ones with the sour grapes. Oh, it's fake. And I saw him do this and I saw him do that. But yet you got kicked off the show because of what you did. So we have to take what you're saying with a grain of salt. So these shows, I stand by them. I'm entertained by them first and foremost. I truly appreciate and love these people and portals to hell. I don't want to leave them out as well. Jack uh, Osborne and Katrina Weidman, they do a great show, show and a oh, job as well. These people bring show. something different and a new dynamic. And that's, that's what people want on TV. And I think that all of these show, shows do a great job of that. And the ones that don't are only here for a season and they're gone. Yeah. I've noticed a lot of these shows will get, they'll saturate the channel with 
show after show after show and some of them have some pretty cool ways of looking at it but they don't last a season and right. you know you you know better than i do i'm just going by you know word of mouth and the way people talk about some of these shows and and, and i get it um real quick story like i say i, I don't want to take away from your time but um when Ghost Hunters was on the air before and Dustin Parry was on there. And I used to think, God, that guy is such a dork. Why would they bring him on the show? And uh, about four years ago, I went to the Ohio State Reformatory. And I've told this story a million times, but uh, that was my wife and I's honeymoon. And so we got there, we got to meet Steve and Dave and uh, and Dustin was there, and uh, anyway, a bunch of other people were. And so Dustin had kind of taken a little group off to the side to do some things. And I went up and I met the guy. And I mean, it was like a man crush, I guess you'd say. He is so knowledgeable, so kind, yep. so genuine. And I looked at my wife and I said, I have been wrong this whole time. That is probably the coolest guy on the team right there. Right. And that's it. So many of these, Dustin is a sweetheart. He's truly one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in the paranormal field. But, you know, your perceptions of people, I, I always warn my listeners. I say, listen, I love my listeners. And if I go out to a big conference, I will hang out with you. I will chat with you. We'll have drinks together. We'll eat together. We'll, we'll have a good time. But if you walk up up to me in a Walgreens when I'm shopping for NyQuil and you start talking to me, I'll start digging at the floor with my toe and I can't make eye contact because I'm an introvert and I'm very uncomfortable in a one-on-one -on -one setting where I didn't expect this to happen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the friends that I have in this field are introverts as well. And sometimes we're looked at as, oh, they're kind of snobbish or what the hell was that all about? Why did he want to get out of here so fast? It's not because we're rude or we have better things to do. A lot of times it's just we're shy. We're embarrassed to be recognized out in public, um, especially if we're with our kids. Uh, you know, I was at the post office the other day mailing a bunch of copies of my book out, and the lady behind the counter goes, Darkness Radio? What's Darkness Radio? And the woman over at the checking in turns and looks at me, and she goes, Are you Darkness Radio? And I said, Yeah. She goes, I love your show. I listen to it all the time. And she looks at the lady behind the counter. She goes, It's one of the best paranormal shows ever. It's an awesome show. And I just, I could feel the, the blood flushing into my face as I was getting more and more embarrassed. And I just wanted to get out of there. She was beautiful to me. She was so sweet and kind. The woman behind the counter was kind. But I just am an introvert. And that was a very uncomfortable situation. Um, I've mentioned that on the air so many times that it's, I, I enjoy, like, my wife and I went to see the Stray Cats at a casino uh, this last year. Brian Setzer. As we're walking in, I feel this gentle tap on my shoulder and I turn around and this girl won't look at me and she goes, I'm not going to make eye contact with you because I know you get uncomfortable in these situations, but I love your show. You guys are great. Keep doing what you do. And she walked away. And I was like, that's what I love. A hit and run compliment. Because if I got to sit there and interact where I wasn't expecting it, I'm going to be all, oh, 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 okay, thank you. <laughs> right. And feel dumb and out of place. So I, I love, and, and I have that happen a lot where people will just kind of give me a gentle, hey, great show and then they take off because they know I'm going to be real uncomfortable real fast but there's a lot of the people in this field that are misunderstood because oh he's goofy he's dopey he's too strong he's too good looking he's she's too this she's too that and they're not given credit for who they really are and you know the thing behind the scenes I got to tell you one thing that I'm very proud of in this community having been a part of this community for 14 years I ran live events we had the biggest and best events out there for 10 years and we raised a stinking lot of money for charities. Mm -hmm. Amazing amounts of money. Every penny raised went directly to those charities. Never once did one of these celebrities stand up and tell me, nah, I don't have something to donate. I don't want to put in my time. Every one of them stepped up and went above and beyond. They would stand there and I could auction a shirt off their back and they'd be embarrassed by it, but we'd raise a thousand dollars. I'd get to bid up to 1200 if the girl could pull the shirt off of that celebrity and they would go with it because that's what they were a part of. And it wasn't because, oh, they just want attention. They would give literally the shirts off their back. And if you don't believe me, look up Darkness Radio auctions on eBay. You'll see videos where I auction things out of the hands of these celebrities, you know, um, and we raised, uh, 
hundreds of thousands, nearly a half million dollars in the first few years of doing this. And these people gave and gave and gave. And we'd do these long ghost hunts at night. We'd come back, regroup, and then and we'd have four or five people that paid $200 each to go back for one more hour with their favorite celebrity. And those celebrities would be tired and exhausted from a whole day of being around fans, doing pictures, autographs, stories, eating, drinking, and then a four hour ghost hunt. But they got up, they went out and they did that extra hour of ghost hunting. So these, wow. these people, every one of them are amazing and they never, never hesitate to help. If there's a, a cause, if there's somebody in need that we can all get behind, uh, and I have to say that carefully because everybody's always got their their GoFundMe pages out to all of us asking to post them and we don't because yeah. <laughs> you have to draw the line at some point. Um, but when we know there's a good cause like um, Haven House, the battered woman shelter in California, um, the, the animal shelters that we've helped, uh, Shriners Children's Hospitals that we've helped, the Child uh, Juvenile du Diabetes uh, Research Foundation, all of these deals that we've raised money for, I'm extremely pleased to say that not one para celebrity has ever refused to help out and they've done it magnanimously with huge smiles and an open generous heart and i've even watched the celebrities sit in the audience during those charity auctions and bid stupid money against each other so that they could get whatever that i was selling and then they would sometimes take that item turn around and donate it to a kid that was sitting in the audience Aww. so they may have just spent eleven hundred dollars on an autograph of george romero and then hand it to the kid that had to duck out at 150 because that's all they could afford. So wow. that's the kind of people that are in this field. So as much bad press as they get, every one of them, every stinking last one of them deserves praise and accolades because they do it and they do it without you even really realizing all the good that they do. How many calls they make the kids, how many people they stop and take pictures and talk to constantly. A lot of these guys can't go more than 20 feet at a mall without being interrupted and they're always kind, they're always there, they're always a part of it. So I give them a lot of credit in this field and uh, I'm proud to be a part of the paranormal field for the radio show, Darkness Radio, now in our 14th year, The Holzer Files, which we're just in the middle of filming season two for Travel Channel, um, any of these aspects. I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this brotherhood, even across TV networks, radio networks, I'm glad to be here and, be, and to know everybody that I've, I've met throughout this journey. Yep, so yeah, it's amazing. Um... You know, I, I wouldn't. Sorry, I'll say, get off my soapbox now. No, 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 no. That's uh, that kind of stuff is what I want people to hear, because a lot of times people will sit here and they watch these shows. Number one, they idolize them to the point where they become extreme fanatics, and they want it to attack you, or they just all they want to do is bombard you with paranormal this, paranormal that, but they don't stop to think. You're you're a person. You put on your pants one um, leg at a time. You know. You get up. You eat breakfast. You brush your teeth. You you know. You gotta take care of household chores. You do all these things. And yes, you're you're on television. Yes, you you do paranormal. But there's more to you than that. I don't want to to say I want to be your friend just because you're in the paranormal. You know what I mean? Right. There's, there's got to be something genuine there. And, you know, I, I've been fortunate. There are some that I can still message them. Um, a couple of them gave me their own phone numbers. I, you know, and I don't try to bug them too much because I know they got a lot going on in their lives. Right. But sometimes I just message and say, hey, how you doing, man? You yeah. know, hey, is there anything I can do for you? And and they answer me right back. It's it's well. With it's that awesome. said, now that I've done your radio show, can you can you unlock the basement door and let me out of the house, please? My family's waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, be right there. I'm actually good at picking locks. So, uh oh, I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> so, Dave, uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer. You you've been so generous with your time. My um, pleasure. Thanks for having me on. If you weren't in the paranormal. You didn't have your show going on, your darkness radio. What what would you be doing right now? Probably sales. That's what I've done my whole life. I love marketing. I love talking to people. I love uh, the, the thrill of the hunt, of finding people to connect with items that they want. 
So that's, I think, what I'd be doing is still be working in sales in some capacity. Okay. I that, wanna... or, that or I'd be a Chunkendale dancer. <laughs> I want to kiss pinball machine. Hook me up. <laughs> Sorry, my, my genie powers aren't working right now. And my last part of that question, and then we'll end it there. Um, what do you want to be remembered for once you're gone? Through it all, I just want to be remembered as a dad that loved his kids more than anything. I'll see. Family man. But you still won't take my kids. <laughs> no. Got it. <laughs> I said I want to be known as a man that loved his kids, not everybody else's. Well, Dave, you've been a wonderful guest, and I I couldn't thank you more. Um, I know it's, you could try. You know what? No. I'll, <laughs> you you get to Texas, I'll take you wherever you want to eat. How's that? All right, sounds good. <laughs> um, any parting words before we go? It, these are strange times this is an opportunity for us to reconnect with each other so that maybe we don't need mediums and psychics at the end of our life cycles to try to connect and make amends. Maybe this is the time to reach out to the family and friends that you know and have and realize just how precious life really is. Take the time to love one another, listen to one another and extend an arm of, uh, of support to others. Um, you know, during this time, I've said, if you email me, daviddarknessradio.com, and you email me your phone number, if you're lonely during this time and feeling like you just need somebody to talk to for five or ten minutes, I will try to give you a call and uh, and do that. And I hope more people will open up their hearts and, and minds to people that may be isolated during this uh, crisis. And uh, this isn't to pat myself on the back. It's hopefully to encourage everybody. Uh, you know, other paranormal celebs and other uh, fans of the paranormal to open their hearts and, and minds to other people that might be in need. But more importantly, to remember to forgive people in your life and yourself and just make the best of the life that we're given. Because as we've seen recently, there are no guarantees. No. So make the best of what we have and, and take that going forward. Wow. Um all I can say is thank you everybody for joining us. I can't follow that up with anything. That was perfect. And where did you say they can get in touch with you? Uh, you can always find all my information at darknessradio.com. Darknessradio.com. And if they, if you do have listeners or followers out there that are lonely, just want a five-minute phone call to say hi, uh, shoot me an email with your phone number. I will be calling you from my uh, business Skype account. And... Uh, we'll have a five or 10 minute talk. Um, you know, I can't, unfortunately I can't do hour long conversations, but you know, if, if you just need somebody to call you up and tell you you're pretty, uh, you're, you're a good person, uh, whatever, you know, I, I'll be more than happy to, to jump in and do that. But, uh, uh, you can also just email me and I'll try to respond to emails as well. So, uh, through all of this, just be kind to yourself and those around you that you love make amends now while you've got the chance. You know, God bless people like you, man. Honestly, not a lot of people would do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I'm going to end it on that note. And, uh, and and please follow this guy. Listen to dark, uh, the Darkness Radio because I'm going to tell you what, I enjoyed it. I even bugged him about it the same night. Hey, I was listening to your show. <laughs> and he's like, who is this guy that keeps messaging me? <laughs> But thank you again, thanks. truly. And thank you all for listening. And join us again on the next episode of Into the Pit. Take care. Bye-bye.